Hi, I'm Phil Webb, Principal Consultant with Select Business Solutions. In Fundamentals of Objects to Users, you have learnt about the ideas behind objects and the idea that the world can be considered to be made up of a variety of different kinds of objects. We have learnt that we can classify them in various ways and that people who interact with things, with objects in general, usually base their interaction on some understanding of the type of object they are interacting with. They have a purpose to which they are putting it, and they have a goal in using those objects. This module on object-oriented software engineering is about how we construct software which carries out that kind of behaviour. In a very simple example, someone might use a software system to emulate something in the real world. They might go to their bank account and request its balance. This requires there to be an object which represents the bank account. It requires a mechanism on the object for making the request get balance. And it requires that the bank account object which receives the message carries out whatever procedures are necessary to calculate the balance and then returns the value to the person who requested them. So we can see that the software engineering and the software technology which you are using to engineer the system is required to handle the incoming message and return the information as if it were a real object. Of course, this in turn requires us to be able to specify in the software how that object is to carry out those operations and to be able to disclose to the user what operations are available on the object. In addition, in a realistic software system, there would need to be a mechanism by which the user can push a button or make a voice command or something else to access the object. A more complicated situation is where there are several operations on the object. So possibly the user might not only request the balance from their bank account, they might also deposit some money or withdraw some money from the bank account. The software that carries out these operations needs to be able to distinguish the incoming messages and obviously carry out the behaviour that is being requested. Further complexity arises when the object is making use of other objects. So it might be that the user is interacting with an ATM or a piece of software on a website and it is not the object which is visible to the user which is able to carry out these operations. Instead, the visible object has to relay a request somehow to another object deeper in the system which eventually uses various transactions on databases and other things to carry out the deposit, withdrawal or to get the balance operation that has been requested. In the end, the user sees the net effect that their requested behaviour has occurred. But behind the scenes, there might be many objects involved. So that deals with increasing numbers of operations on objects and also the possibility of the larger numbers of objects involved in each of the operations. Further complexity is introduced when we can see that the user might actually have several bank accounts. In their web-based interface to their banking services, they might see these several accounts. So they need to specify for which account they are requesting the balance or between which two accounts they are transferring money. This is not only because there are several bank accounts in operation, but also because the same behavioural interface is available for each account. The same operations are available on them. So as well as identifying the operation that we are requesting, we need to identify which account object or objects we are dealing with. In other cases, of course, some of these accounts might be different from one another. Some of them might be check accounts and some might be savings accounts. There might be interest earned and conditions on withdrawals, perhaps a number of days notice are required. So the situation becomes more complex. Not only as the number of objects available to the user increases, but also as the number of different types of objects increases. Some of these types may exhibit different behaviour from one another and therefore provide different sets of operations. Other types, despite their differences, may have overlapping areas of behaviour and therefore have some operations in common. For operations to be common between types, it's important that their behaviour has the same meaning. That is, that they are semantically the same. For example, a banking system might allow users to get the balance of their account whereas a book ordering system might allow users to get the price of a book. 
In both cases, a monetary value is returned, but they have different meanings. One of them is a bank account, which is indicating the amount of money which may be withdrawn. The other is a book, which is indicating the amount of money for which it may be purchased. It's important to recognise and retain these differences in meaning. In each of the segments of this module, you will see that there are several aspects of the engineering of the systems which are useful to people which are consistent or have some similarities. Firstly, there are dynamic aspects of the system, which is to do with the way in which messages are being sent and operations are being carried out. Secondly, there is the static, the static aspect of the system, so there has to be some definition of the types of objects, sets of operations available, what classes there are and so on, along the lines that we have discussed in terms of classification of objects. For both the dynamic and static aspects, there is another issue which is to do with how much of the behaviour of the system is visible to the users and is accessible to the users and how much of it is hidden away. So there are the external and the internal aspects of the system. And yet another aspect of each of the segments is that we need to be discussing both the user's perspective, the subject domain in which the operations are being carried out, as distinct from the system domain which is implementing those operations and providing the perception that the behaviour is being carried out. So we have static and dynamic behaviour, we have internal and external behaviour, and we have the subject domain and system domain behaviour. We will be describing these for systems of increasing complexity, ranging from simple objects with small numbers of operations up to large numbers of objects with multiple operations. This arises from the complexity in the internals of the system, which allow those operations to be carried out. So there is quite a lot to discuss. Along the way, we're going to be talking about the reasons for going to this amount of trouble to model these aspects. You might think that we can get away with systems that are less complex than this, and historically, you would be right, because not all complex systems were made so complicated in the old days. However, while it is a good idea to make systems as simple as possible, it is also a good idea to make them no simpler. As Einstein reminded us, and what tends to happen if you try to make the system simpler than it really can be, is that it ends up being more complicated because you're glossing over some differences between important elements of the system which need to be taken care of in other ways and that can be problematic. So there is a general issue here about what kind of systems we should be building to provide a behaviour that users want. This leads us to a common characteristic of object-oriented systems. If you ask most people what object orientation is all about, or what is object-oriented thinking, they will tell you something like this. Object-oriented systems produce a natural model. They produce more realistic models that closely map to things in the real world. It involves creating objects which emulate objects in the subject domain to which they apply. This can seem fairly esoteric but it is a very important aspect of the advantages of using an object-oriented approach to the software engineering of these systems. We're going to be discussing in the session on modelling and mapping the importance of creating natural models and the characteristics that those models have and the advantages that they give us. Finally, towards the end of this module, we cover some bits of descriptions of different disparate technologies which are required to complete the story. We touch on some aspects of architecture. So as well as getting into more detail, we're talking about internals of the technology. We are also going to be talking about some broader brush issues, which need to be taken into account when you are involved in engineering systems. Because not only are we concerned here about people who are using software-based systems, we are also concerned about you guys who are also people and involved in engineering these systems. And you have an important role to play in carrying out this engineering. So when you're working in teams with other software developers, it's important to know what kinds of things other people are doing and where the boundaries are around the roles that you play in creating systems. 
To put this module in context, we have already said that it builds on the information that is available to you in the module on fundamentals of objects to users as regards the user's view of the world. But it also forms a basis for some more detailed modules on object-oriented analysis. This OO analysis takes requirements for systems and organizes information about the requirements to help people build and design systems using object-oriented technology and also to be able to verify whether the system is the correct one or not. It also acts as a prelude to the module on object-oriented design. This takes those requirements and converts them into a description of what has to be built. You will see in that module that the design is the difficult bit and it is important to be able to verify that the system carries out the behavior that is required of it. At the design stage, we're going to be interested in what the system is, what performance the system is required to provide, and verifying that it does that. Did we build the system right? The analysis activities are at a higher level and are concerned with describing the purpose of the system and validating whether the system that we have produced actually serves that purpose. Did we build the right system?